I love history. We have so much anxiety about the future, we seek comfort in the past. It helps us answer the question of who are we? The Bremen mission started Black Week. The 8th Air Force sustained more casualties on this week than any other week during the war or in history. Bremen, Germany was known by the flyers to be Flak City with over 300 Flak batteries. Remember, D-Day occurred June 1944. In 1942, 1943, and early 1944, Allied Air Forces were the only way to attack inside the Nazi German fortress. Hitler had to be defeated. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Army's 8th Air Force was established. In less than a year, it was tasked with defeating the most powerful air force in the world, the German Luftwaffe. 26,000 8th Air Force men died, more than all the U.S. Marines lost in World War II. The 100th was the most famous bomb group of World War II. The Air Force was a glamorous job. They had high-tech weapons. The B-17 looked like a guiding light. It was a national treasure. The 100th Bomb Group is located next to the village of Thorpe Abbotts in East Anglia, approximately 100 miles from London. There's a great museum there. The mission will likely be featured on a TV series about the 100th Bomb Group. The TV series will complete Tom Hanks' World War II trilogy of Band of Brothers about the 101st Airborne Division and the Pacific about Marines in the Pacific War. Justice Snappen was the lead plane for the bomber wing. When a lead plane dropped its bombs, all the others behind it dropped theirs. When it turned left, all the others turned left. They successfully bombed the target, which in this case was a Nazi airfield. Nine Nazi fighters were destroyed, a record that stands today for a single plane on a single mission. Two Nazi fighters were damaged. Five Purple Hearts were earned by the crew. Two earned Distinguished Service Crosses, our nation's second highest military honor. Three earned Silver Stars, our third highest military honor. Praise to the men on the back of the ship, the gunners that you don't hear about so often. They were the real heroes. The enemy that day was Flack and Messerschmitt aircraft. It was important to destroy the Luftwaffe for many reasons. Eisenhower wanted his soldiers protected from the Luftwaffe when they landed on the Normandy beaches. On D-Day, he told our soldiers that when they look up, the planes they will see will be ours. That's because the 8th Air Force had destroyed the Luftwaffe. This is a Messerschmitt ME-410. It looks identical to a Messerschmitt 210 and looks very similar to a Messerschmitt 110. The gunners would train with uh, studying silhouettes, including those on the playing cards. Uh, are these playing cards representatives of friends or enemies? Are they allies or should we shoot them down? A B-17 on the left is a friend. It has four engines, a blip on the top from the top turret gunner and a blip on the bottom from the ball turret gunner. The Measure Schmidt ME-410, 210, or 110 is an enemy. Um, The Messerschmitt had two machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannons. Is this a friend or an enemy? It's a Messerschmitt ME-109, an enemy. They had two machine guns and, tw and a 20 millimeter cannon on this single seater plane. I'm thankful to Harry Crosby, the navigator, for the careful log he kept. He wrote the book, Wing in a Prayer, published in 1993. 
You can buy it on Amazon used because it's no longer published. I'm grateful to Donald Miller for writing Masters of the Air, a stunning achievement. The B-17 is a living symbol of American courage and sacrifice. Just a snapping lasted four months and cost $300,000. Bremen was the crew's 18th mission. The crew positions from front are bombardier, navigator, pilot, co-pilot, top turret gunner slash engineer, radio operator slash top gunner, right and left waist gunners, tail gunner. Additionally, uh, Jack Kidd, the command pilot, flew on this day. 11 total men, just like a football team. The Germans were afraid of the B-17. They called them Boeings. This photo was taken just before the mission, standing from left to right. Bill McClellan, the ball turret gunner, Harry Crosby, the navigator from Iowa, Charlie Vi, the co-pilot slash tail gunner, Everett Blakely, my dad, the pilot from Seattle, Jim Douglas, the bombardier, Lester Saunders, waste gunner from Chicago, and he was a bailiff before the war. Monroe Thornton, the top turret gunner. Ed Yevich, the other waste gunner. Lyle Nord, the tail gunner. Ed Forkner, the radio operator slash top gunner. Uh, they gave each other nicknames. My dad called Douglas Brush because of his mustache. Douglas called Dad Skeleton because he was skinny. Major Jack Kidd, the command pilot, also flew, and his job was to keep the wing in order. After the war, he made his way up to become a two-star general. I'm going to show you several paintings of Justice Snappen. They are uh, paintings of that airplane, not stock paintings. This one shows Justice Snappen taking off for Bremen, and just behind it is... Uh, Lucky Luckadoo's plane. Approximately 48th Air Force bases in England. Each green dot represented a base. The yellow dot is the 100th Bomb Group. This map does not include English RAF bases. The English lost as many men in planes as we did. They flew at night and we flew in the daytime. They continue to be great allies. If you travel over there, you'll find out just how much like us they are. This is a map of the 8th Air Force assembly areas. First, planes joined to become squadrons, squadrons joined to become groups, then groups to form wings and wings to form the division. You can see how easy it would be to collide with another plane. No radar. Getting through the clouds was danger. Dangerous. The planes had to get into flying formation 100 feet apart for mutual safety. Assembly was complicated, dangerous, and time-consuming. Across the North Sea, they had time for food, chewing gum, or chocolate, but due to the cold, the sandwiches were frozen. They had to maintain a close formation for mutual protection. The route to Bremen passed the North Sea. At the initial point, they turned on to the bomb run. They had to fly on a straight level line and could not avoid flak. It was dangerous. Bremen targets included an airfield, shipbuilding company, railway station, shipyards, aircraft factory, oil refinery, steel mill, submarine pens, and they even made submarine <laughs> submarines there. Uh, different aircraft had different targets, all of military value. The 88 was designed as an anti-aircraft gun, almost a semi-automatic design that after firing automatically ejected the spent shell and could be loaded immediately. It fired 20 rounds per minute. Flak is a contraction of German Flieger Abwehr Kanone meaning aircraft defense cannon. Bremen was known as Flak City. They sent up a box barrage that day. 
Why were they so especially dangerous this time? Several reasons. Due to new proximity fuses, new mechanical computers, new altitude calculating radar. Hermann Göring also said, and he was the head of the Luftwaffe, he threatened to send them to the Eastern Front if they weren't more successful. When flak explodes, it leaves a black ball, a puff. It penetrates the airplane like buckshot going through paper. If it explodes next to the plane, it can destroy a wing. Temptation with flak like this is to have a short bomb run, which means drop the bomb short or wide of the target, avoid the flak, and get out. They were sold on the idea of never doing that. They didn't want to come back. They wanted to do it right the first time. It took the flak gunners on the grounds 15 seconds to sight it a B-17 accurately. The bombardier needed 25 seconds on the bomb run to operate his Norton bomb sight. The plane is most vulnerable to flak during that 25 seconds. They have to fly straight, allowing the anti-aircraft gunners more time to sight them in. After the mission, the photo reconnaissance unit camera showed the bombs were accurate. On releasing the bombs, the bombardier, Douglas, gives the thumbs up to Crosby. Crosby records the time of the event. Look at his slide rule calculators and analog stopwatch. Over Bremen, the sky was filled with flak, the worst flak they had ever seen. They took their first flak hit on the underside. Something hit the fore engine. Something hit the left wing. Stabilizers gone. Left elevator smashed. Number four engine on fire. Fire extinguisher won't work. There's only one other way to put out the engine fire, dive and blow it out. Down they went, dropping 3,000 feet. Pulling out of the dive, their stomach dropped down into their pelvis. The fire's out. Then number two sputters and goes out. They head for home at 10,000 feet, losing altitude. After the bomb drop, they all had a conference over the interphone. What was the extent of the damage? What could they do? If they continued, the plane might be consumed by fire. The engine was burning and falling apart. They continued to lose altitude. They were 200 miles from home considered landing in Germany. They would get pay for the rest of the war. They settled the discussion in a millisecond and headed for home. They were slow and out of the protective formation of the group. The policy of the Luftwaffe was to attack stragglers. What were the injuries? Lester Saunders and Ed Yevich were the race gunners. They were both hit. Saunders was hit in the gut by a 20 millimeter cannon shell. Yevich sustained a compound open fracture of his forearm. This illustration from uh, Death Was Our Co-Pilot by Ev Blakely and Fred Barton was published six months after Bremen in True Magazine. Forkner put a compress on Saunders' spurting, spurting wound he put antibiotic powder and paste in the blood and pressed it down to stop the bleeding. The radio compartment was cold, colder than a freezer. The top hatch and waste gunner ports were left open. Sub-zero temperatures froze the styrets of morphine, which Forkner had to warm in his mouth to thaw. Wounded included Bill McClellan, the ball turret gunner, he was wounded on the face and scalp, and he had a big hole in his thigh. He put his hand in the thigh wound to tell there was no fracture. Flack even slashed his oxygen mast into ribbons, but he stayed there until all attacks ceased. He then climbed into the radio compartment for first aid. When he got there, another ch large chunk of flak came through the bottom of the plane and hit McClellan square in the back. It bounced him in the air, but didn't hurt him because he was lying on two steel flak suits. Flak suits saved lots of lives. 
He had three shots of morphine without having much effect. Later, when he saw the preparations for landing, he thought they were preparing for a new attack by enemy planes, and someone had to sit on him to keep him from getting back into the ball turret to fight again. Because of the morphine, he thought he was dying and he didn't want to die. That's the kind of soldier we had flying over Germany. Charlie Vi wasn't doing well in the tail gunner's position. Fragments of shell exploded in his compartment and wounded him in the leg, and after that, a big chunk of flak came through the flesh of his hip, making an ugly wound and barely missing his spine. His sciatic nerve was severed. If anything kept them in the air, it was accurate and deadly gunnery, the result of long and painstaking practice. Every minute of training paid out in a big way. It was the policy of the Luftwaffe to attack stragglers. There they were, limping back over Germany at a crawling speed of 100 miles per hour. The plane stalls and falls out of the air at 90 miles per hour. They ran the gauntlet of German fighters. Is this a friend or an enemy? Correct, it's a Messerschmitt, an enemy. Monroe Thornton, Thorny, was a top turret gunner slash engineer. He was credited with three kills. Sergeant Thornton got the first one, shooting the Germans' propeller off. They could see the pilot bail out. He got a second one. Everyone saw it burst into flames, and it dropped towards Earth. Thornton got his third kill later as they crossed the Dutch border. Ball turret gunner Bill McClellan got two enemy fighters. The ball turret gunner went into the turret at the beginning of the flight and stayed there the whole time. Bill got very cold, but was warmed if he shot the gun as the hot expelled brass cartridges warmed him up, made him more comfortable. Bill McClellan earned a silver star and purple heart on the mission. Due to the huge hole in his thigh, he spent 22 months in the hospital but went on to have two great kids in Colorado. Charlie Vi in the tail gunner's position and Lyle Nord in the top gun fired at this uh, Measure Schmidt 410. Vi got two planes and Lyle Nord won. Charlie Vi got his second plane going away. The score for the day attacked many, many times and they thought they finished 12 planes but the official findings credit you with a kill only if you see the pilot bail out, see the plane disintegrate in air, or see the plane hit the ground and blow up. So they were credited with nine planes destroyed and two seriously damaged. Thornton got three, McClellan two, Vi two, Saunders one, Nord one. Two Luftwaffe fighters were damaged by Douglas and one by Crosby. This was difficult because of the way the guns, their guns were mounted. After the war, the Germans released statistics on their fighter losses for October 8th. 27 German losses on the Bremen mission. Nine from the gunners of Justice Snappen. The collision with a B-17 is also recorded. Blakely and Major Kidd had been giving the plane evasive action. One would see Flack on their side and jerk the plane away. The other would see Flack on the other side and dodge in the opposite direction. With two good engines, two bad ones, and torn controls making steering so tough that it took all of Blakely's strength to steer the plane, they dropped to 3,000 feet when they crossed the coast. Ground soldiers fired at them with rifles. The rubber inflatable laugh, laugh, <laughs> life raft and life vest were shot to pieces so they could not crash into the North Sea. Over water, they thring, threw things overboard to lighten their weight. The guns went first, the ammunition, the radio, the camera, the priceless bomb site, the thermos bottles, any extra clothing. Due to the lighter weight, they gained 300 feet. They needed it. They were running low on fuel.
The ship touched ground at Ludham Airfield. Instantly, the cables operating the brakes snapped, the landing gear collapsed, their elevator was useless. The plane wouldn't taxi, wouldn't steer. With the terrific momentum of 100 miles per hour, they plowed down that vacant airport through towards a huge tree which they hit near the pilot seat. There's a huge flak hole in the elevator and several in the wings. The control wires were cut. The big hole could only be produced by a nearby exploding flak shell. The smaller holes in the vertical rudder could be flak fragments, cannon shells, or machine gun bullets. The plane was a wreck, scrap metal only. The salvage crew counted 800 holes and then got tired of counting. Many holes were missed because they could not be seen on the bottom of the plane. When they got back to Thorpe Abbott's, all their personal belongings were removed from the barracks. They were presumed dead or missing after being late two hours, and their personal effects were removed to keep morale up for the remaining airmen. Saunders, Vi, McClellan, Yevich were all taken to the hospital. Saunders died a week later. He's buried in Cambridge American Cemetery. Visit him if you get a chance. Vi and McClellan and Yevich were transferred to Walter Reed Hospital. Nord was killed the next spring in his new plane. They promoted Crosby to be group navigator, Douglas group bombardier, and Everett to be commander of the 418th Squadron. Vi recovered but had continued foot drop and pain, which may have led to his early demise in 1965. He became a successful lawyer and married a high school friend of my mom's. He had four great children. Crosby became a professor and continued to write. He had three great kids. Douglas had two kids, and, and Dad also, also uh, worked in the Air Force. He married my mom and had six children. The 100th Bomb Group in late 1943 and 1944 performed the impossible. They did what Hitler felt they could never do. What's more, the Luftwaffe generals in combat with the fortresses had advised Hitler that it couldn't be done. They flew in broad daylight into every sector of Germany. There wasn't a target in the Third Reich even the most eastern part of the country, which was safe from their attentions. And all this was accomplished against the strongest and most lethally equipped fighter force which had ever been assembled. Thank you, and if you need to contact me, here's my email. Adios.